99% of being impressive is impressive to no one. It's all the work that nobody sees and nobody's impressed by to hopefully qualify you someday to do something that impresses someone. People write it off as like a magical power. Well, I could show you how I did it and I could teach you how to do it and it gave me five years, I could get you there, but they don't want that. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, how an entrepreneur who failed at a string of businesses, like I'm talking about almost a dozen business failures, how he went from $400,000 in debt to today being on track to generate nine figures, and the lessons he learned from becoming a world-class pianist. That's pianist. Not, not what you're probably thinking. You may know today's guest, Jeff Lerner, from his podcast. You may know him as a speaker or maybe because of his YouTube channel. Or you know him because he's the founder of the fastest growing business education company in the world, Entre Institute. But this 12-time business failure wasn't always a success he appears to be today. Yes, Entre Institute is on pace to do nine figures in revenue only three years in. And yes, he had three successful businesses between the 12 failures, which we're going to get into, and Entre Institute. But what we don't see, at least what I didn't know, is that Jeff's thinking, his approach to business, and his absolutely remarkable journey was one that started at a piano. I got into music, interestingly, I, I wasn't one of those guys that had like this, initially anyways, I didn't have like this deep soul in my heart that, that needed to be drawn out into the world so that I could find solace and meaning in the universe or whatever. It was actually pretty practical. I, I had a guitar when I was a kid, um, kind of middle school. I went through like the Guns N' Roses, Metallica, <laughs> learned to play power chords. So you um, learned to play like, Enter Sandman? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I had the tablature book for like four Metallica albums and I knew every note that Kirk Hammett ever played. I just could only play them at like one tenth the speed. But, but, uh, but I figured out anyway, I knew enough from my childhood dabbling with guitar to know that I actually was a pretty good musician. I had aptitude. I had a good ear. I, could, I only had to play things once or twice and I could retain them. Um, and I was pretty musical. Like once I, once I played a line, you know, there was some soul there. And so I kind of knew I had this, this knack, but I wasn't really interested in it. Uh, I was more interested in like sports and girls and all the, you know, kid, being a girl, kid in America kind of stuff. But then I was 16 years old and it happened, it, it literally happened in a moment. I, I actually got kicked out of high school my sophomore year. Wow. Uh, I went to a private school and, and it was hold this on, very on, highfalutin private school. Why did you get they kicked out of high school? They, well, let me, let me actually correct myself. They were so highbrow that they didn't actually kick you out. They just declined to re-invite you back the next year. That's Did how they do it. Did come from money? Uh, my parents were successful. They didn't come from money, but my mom was an attorney. My dad was a money manager, both really successful, firstborn, overachieving, you know, self-made people. And they gave me a great life growing up. And I went to this private school where by no means was I the wealthy kid at the school. I actually lower middle of the road, even though I had successful professional parents, because there were a lot of kids at that school that had, you know, multi-generational, you know, trust type of money. And so this school, they just would just not invite you back. And so I didn't get reinvited. And it was like a month before my junior year was supposed to start. And my, and my mom was talking to somebody else, one of the other parents, and they're like, oh, when did you get your letter? And my mom's like, we didn't get the letter. And they're like, oh, you didn't get the letter? Every summer, they would send you a letter re-inviting you to come back. And like, oh, you didn't get the letter. And my mom made some calls and turned out, oh, they're like, yeah, we didn't send the letter. We don't want Jeff back. So well, what, did, uh, what did you do? What kind of- I, Last you? minute, they found a boarding school that I could go to because I was so uh, just disavowed, like, or, or whatever the word would be, like, just unwilling to go to public school. I just, I, I had, I kind of always had some problems with authority and like my parents felt like it's better to keep Jeff in a little more, you know, secure private school type environment, which is ironically probably wasn't actually the case. I think I bristled more with the, the strictures of public, of private school anyway, but, but anyway, this is all going somewhere. 
So I go, last minute I get enrolled in a boarding school. I go up there, I don't know anybody. It's freezing cold. It's Massachusetts, I, semester, I'm like shivering. And I come down with, I guess it wasn't freezing cold when I got there, it was like September. But anyway, I, uh, I just remember it being cold. I remember it looking like, at the t- I remember reading the book, Ethan Frome. I don't know if you've ever read that book, but like that's what I pictured in my mind. It was just like always gray and cold. But anyway, so I go up there and I contracted mono like the second week of school. So now I'm, a, I'm at this new boarding school by myself. I don't have any friends. I have mono, so I can't go to class. So I'm living in like a dorm and I can't leave the dorm because I can't be around anyone. They put me in my own room by myself and they say, don't go to class until you're well. And we don't know when that'll be. So I'm just alone. I'm alone in Western Massachusetts on some campus where I don't know anyone and I can't go be around people. So I would go out on these walks. That's why I remember it being so cold. And I discovered this old abandoned music building because they had built a new music building and moved all the desks and chairs and instruments to the new music building. But there was just an old building kind of run down that still had one piano in it. And so I was I was alone all day, couldn't do anything. And I would go into this building and I started picking out tunes on this piano. And it was within a week that I had this epiphany. And I, at the time, you know, teenagers are very dramatic. I experienced it as like, you know, uh, Charlton Heston, like voice of God is like, Jeff, you will play piano or else you will have to get a job. And uh, it just hit in that moment. I was like, okay, this is my out. This is my, I I have been so dysfunctional inside of the system, which at that point was school. But I recognize school is essentially just this extended indoctrination slash job training program to graduate you into. And I, I already knew I needed some other path. And when I found that piano and, and it was, it there was actually kind of some magic to it. And I don't know how to explain this, but within a month, I taught myself to play the first movement of Moonlight Sonata by ear. Now, yes. that's not the most technically demanding piece in the world, but for somebody that's not a, a, a pianist, to pick it out by ear in a month, um, I recognized, okay, I've got, this is my thing. And God told me I need to do it. And so I went back home at the end of that semester. My mom, when I came home for Thanksgiving break and I'd had mono for three months, my mom took one look at me and I looked like I was, I, I was on, the, on death's doorstep. You know, I was so sick. And she was like, I can't, I can't take this. You're never going back. You're coming to live with me again. I'll take care of you. I'll nurse you back to health. And I told her, thank you, but I don't think I want to go to school anymore. I think I'm supposed to play music. And they actually, it took some convincing. They ended up supporting me. My mom withdrew me from high school halfway through my junior year and I became a musician. Okay, so th- there's there's a, there's a lot there. I mean, first of all, I find it really interesting. I I around the same age was self taught with piano, so I sat mm. down and I learned. I, I I took one year of piano and I learned the C scale. And so I sat down. I do C, and then I by ear I went through all of you know the, the scales. I guess. Yeah. And yeah. then I had a friend say, "Hey, you know, if you know the scales, it's just one three five is a major chord." And I'm like, what? And they're like, oh, and if you drop the third finger, it's a minor chord. And I'm like, yeah. huh? and it like, it like unlocked the fact that you could pick up a melody from any song and you could basically, I mean, I'm not very good, but, but that you could pick out a melody and play it by ear just by, by having the, the chords. It was, yeah. it was crazy to me. So, uh, so there was a bunch there though. You, you bristled against the system. You, you, you knew already that you weren't made for school so you assumed you weren't made for the workplace how did the musical career go um so i was fortunate i mean i was i I will never take for granted how fortunate i was that my parents actually gave me a safe space for a couple years they allowed me to drop out of high school they actually bought a piano for me to practice and they gave me a couple years and but 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 i'd always had this deal with my parents because i you know they were successful and i grew up with a lot of creature comforts and a nice you know i had I had toys and we could go on summer vacations and stuff, but they always told me, they said, Jeff, you know, when you turn 18, you're going to have to go into the real world and experience it like we did because we're not going to ruin you. And the thing is, I went to school with a bunch of rich trust fund kids, so I knew what it looked like when families got all like blue bloody and weird. Yeah. And so they were like, we're not going to let that happen to you. 
No matter how much money we ever make, we're not going to let it turn you into one of those warped kids or warped adults. And they, and they were actually pretty funny about it. So, um, so, so I did knew you feel that, like a have not because, because obviously you, you are around people with, with money, you're around your parents who are showing you what's possible. Did you, did you feel on easy street or did you feel like you had to work for things? Uh, I, my bit, my real experience of being young wasn't so much have or have not. It was just fit in or not fit in. And it was, I don't fit in. So I, it, I because here's the thing, I would go to summer camp and I'd be around different to this basketball camp every summer at the University of Houston. It was like in the inner city. And I was around a lot of kids from a totally different socioeconomic bracket. It didn't matter where I went. I never fit in. I didn't know how, I've actually learned now that I'm like a little tiny bit Asperger's. And so I just never quite clicked with the games and the protocols and the, just the ways that you're supposed to be, especially when you're young and it's all about popularity and, and, and playing these games. And, and I just always, I used to have dreams about my alien race coming down to earth to get me and take me home. Because I just, even as a kid, I, I had this sense that I didn't fit in. And so, um, honestly, when I dropped out, it was just relief. It was like, I don't have to go to this place eight hours a day anymore and try to fit into something that I know I don't belong with. And music, again, it started as a practical thing because I knew I had a skill and that that skill I could eventually develop into a career that I could at least survive. But very quickly, it actually became, it did become my soul's opportunity to express and, and to find my place in the world. And what it really became is a, is a safety mechanism to be able to connect with people, but still have that, that instrument and that sound between me and them. Like doing what I'm doing right now was terrifying to me for most of my life, but I could very easily reach people with music uh, long before I could with work. That makes sense. <laughs> this is why I believe we need to spend more time, especially when we're younger, we need to spend more time just trying things, playing, experimenting, tasting, and not be so focused on like the, the life plan. Because for those of us who are ambitious, for those of us who are achievers, and if you are listening to this, that is you, that's me, that's all of us. We want to make sure that everything we do is part of the plan. We don't want to waste time on stuff that's not going to help us. We don't want to spend time on stuff that's not going to be a part of what we do or what we build or what we create or where we're going or developing skills. Like, what a waste of time and energy, right? And yet, with Jeff's story and where we're about to go with this, at 17, he was too old. Teachers didn't want to teach him. They told him he couldn't do it. Like, what the hell is up with that? But luckily for Jeff and for us, because we can learn from Jeff, he was too stubborn to listen. <laughs> And if you're asking yourself, what does all this piano talk have to do with building a nine-figure business? Just wait. Just wait and see. Because the time he spent at the keyboard actually laid the groundwork for what came next. It was the ultimate training ground for entrepreneurship. I have said that many times. I, I wrote it. I have a book coming out next year, and there's a whole thread about that in the book. Um, yeah, so I mean, you asked how the career went. So I started at 16, I crash coursed. I went and bought a book called The Jazz Piano Book by Mark Levine. Um, and, I, and, I, and the reason I bought a book and I started teaching myself theory so quickly is because I very quickly realized, um, you know, because I would like, I tried to go get a teacher and I would go to these teachers and I was 17, 18 years old at this point and I wanted, I'm like, hey, I want to be in your studio. I want to play. I want to go to college. I want to make a career out of this. And, uh, and they were like, well, we'll play for me. And I'm like, well, no, I just started. And they're like, oh, we, you know, we, we can't teach you. You can't, basically they told, they all told me it was too late to be a, to be a professional. And so I realized, and, and they, and I said, what do you mean? And they said, you just have to start when you're young, your hands, like a lot of it's just biomechanical. Your hands aren't going to do what you need them to do. And I realized, or at least I, I believed them that, okay, so I'm never going to win this, this game on technique and, and like virtuoso prowess. But I, but I know I'm smart. So I bought a book on theory and I started teaching myself all the modes and all the cadences and all the jazz progressions and all the harmonic extensions. And, and I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a theory nerd. Like, like I'm, a, I'm a Buckminster Fuller of um, but you're, I used to walk you're a theory nerd on everything. If anyone follows you on Instagram, they know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I do tend to go, I'm a learner. I, what, what can I say? I can't help it. But, um, 
I go deep on theory. I used to walk around with a stack of note cards, probably about six inches thick, that had every mode, every chord, every key, every progression, every harmonic extension, and I would just drill myself. It would be like, you know, D flat seven, uh, you know, Locrian mode, go. And I would just have to name the note. Like D, and the D, by the way, D flat, uh, D flat Locrian mode has an E double flat in it and an F flat and all these weird notes. And I would just rattle it off. Like I, I just went kind of geeky with it. But the reason that was important was it allowed me to pretty quickly start to get work um, doing accompanying because I could go into a, 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 a after, I mean, it took a few years of like, I just stayed home and practiced for like 10 hours a day for like two or three years. But once I started getting some work, I could go into a, let's say a rehearsal, uh, like a jazz band rehearsal, and they could give me the score. And, you know, you'd have the alto sax line and alto sax is a, it's been a while and alto sax is an E flat instrument. And then you have the tenor sax line and that's a B flat instrument. And I could, whatever the lines were, and sometimes you'd have like a viola part that's written on an alto clef where middle C is the middle line. And th this stuff just totally confuses the hell out of most people. I could actually transpose, I could sight read and transpose and, and harmonize and transpose. I could transpose off of lead sheets on the fly. So they'd give me music that was a melody and some chord changes. And the singer would go, oh yeah, but I've got a cold. Can we take it down a whole step? And I could play it. You know, I might need a minute or two to think it through. So it was kind of like were this you, Rain Man. Did you find your genius or was it just hard work and training? It was hard work and training. So uh, every single, like I wanted to teach myself. I was obsessed with having perfect pitch, but I didn't have it. So I started, I remember taking, I would, I would pick a song and I would try to memorize, and I knew what song the key was in, and I, or what key the song was in, and I would try to memorize it, and I would listen to it really hard at night before I went to sleep. And then when I wake up in the morning, I would try to nail the opening pitch, having remembered through my sleep what it sounded like, and I kept missing it. And I would get so mad. So finally, I let go of having perfect pitch, and I said, but, but I know I can memorize intervals, and I know I can memorize harmonic combinations. So I took every single chromatic interval there's 12 i mean you know there's 12 chromatic intervals there's a half step a whole step a minor third a major third a fourth a sharp fourth a fifth and and so on and i would find a song where the first two notes of the melody spelled out that interval and i would find one that was descending and one that was ascending so like for like a perfect fifth i took uh the way you look tonight someday when i'm awfully low da da that's a descending fifth and then I took Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, which is Twinkle, Twinkle. That's an ascending fifth, da, da. So now I know what a descending fifth and an ascending fifth sound like. Well, I can memorize melodies. And I'd, so I had 24 songs, an ascending and a descending for each of the 12 chromatic intervals based on the opening notes of the melody. So now I had memorized every intervallic combination. Then I started listening to chords and trying to pick out all the different intervals and match them to the songs. And then I could stack chords. And then I eventually just, I learned what chords sound like. So now you can play a minor seven or a major seven or a dominant seven with a, a sharp four or a sharp 11, however you want to call it. I just know what it sounds like now. But it was years of, of living like a crazy person because I was obsessed with mastering the language of music because I knew that if I was good enough at music, it would people would accept me, nay, they would even love me without really having to get to know me, which terrified me. I love how Rain Man <laughs> Jeff just went on his approach to learning piano. Did, did you see that? Like, he went off. But, but also, did you catch how he deconstructed and planned out becoming a pro musician? Apparently, too old to be taught, I'm not going to let that one go. I'm going to just hold on to that one because that one really bothers me. He didn't have perfect pitch, but not be, you know, being too old, not having perfect pitch, all of that stuff, it doesn't matter because he spent hours each day practicing and challenging himself to play a game within the game, which interestingly enough is something that Michael Jordan was known for doing to keep engaged when things became like a really big slog. And then, did you hear how he hacked systems? that worked for his mind, that worked for his thinking, that worked for his learning strategy to become damn good at it. That is entrepreneurship right there. That's how passion and an almost obsessive level of focus and determination help people without a born gift crush it and win. So you probably have this thought. I know I did. Do you have to be crazy 
to be able to get that good at something? I don't know. I, no, I think you could. I think you could be born with more talent than I had. I had enough talent. Like I was like, like who was I? I was like a meta world piece, or, or, or you know, the basketball player. What's his name? Um, he's like tough, and he's strong, and he's fast, but he's not the most gifted, skilled player on the floor. But he just he he combines that with with just straight up work. So he had enough talent to make it in the league. And then everything else, or like Patrick Beverly, the, the, the guard on the Clippers, who's just, he's, he's a defensive specialist. He's a shutdown specialist. He just outworks everybody. But he still had to have enough talent to play in the league, right? Yeah. That was me. I had enough talent to make it to that level, but I was willing to do what other people weren't willing to do. And that's why by my mid-20s, I was playing gigs that, that, that were better caliber gigs than the 50- and 60-year-old piano players, a lot of them for 30 years because people knew he shows up on time. Jeff sound tests his own equipment. Jeff always brings all the right gear. Jeff's suit is cut like it actually fits. Jeff combs his hair. Jeff doesn't smoke. Jeff doesn't disappear on the brakes. Jeff can play tunes in any key. And we only have to tell Jeff something once or teach Jeff something once and he'll remember it and he'll retain it and he'll go home and he'll drill it and he'll be prepared with it the next time. So I got really in demand. And what's interesting, I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of, of the storyline here, but it, this is actually how I became an entrepreneur because by my mid-20s, uh, again, not by virtue of my talent or my, my skill at the keyboard, but by some of these more intangibles, I, was, I had become one of the in-demand guys for a lot of the highest level gigs in town. And I mean like, like, if, like for example, uh, James Baker, former Secretary of State, right? 70th birthday party, he's having a dinner party with 12 of his friends and he wants somebody to come play piano in his house. Somebody that has to get checked out by the Secret Service and go sit in a room full of diplomats and billionaires and, and be charming and be professional, also not know how to shut up and do his job. And so like, it was a lot of those kind of factors that got me these gigs. So in, over the course of about two years, I played gigs for half a dozen billionaires. I played for Tillman Fertitta, the guy that owns the Rockets. I played for Jim and Francie Crane, who were married at that time. They're divorced now, but Jim Crane owns the Houston Astros. I played for Bob McNair, the guy that owns the Houston Texans. When Bob McNair wanted to debut the new Houston Texans fight songs for all of his coaches at a dinner, he requested me by name from the previous year's Christmas party. So all of a sudden, I'm playing piano for these billionaires, and I actually kind of got to know them. And so what I realize is, wait, these are all people that started businesses, mm. huh? They have a lot of what I love about my life, which is freedom, creativity. They get to kind of set their own schedules. Only they have crap tons of money and I have none. So maybe, maybe, maybe actually I should be an entrepreneur instead of a musician. And by the way, I have billionaires to talk to about that. So I even got a little bit of mentorship and that's when I got inspired to really, really lean in and start, start starting businesses. And then, you know, I did the obligatory fail at a dozen businesses before you finally make it work. And I ended up in a ton of debt. But, but to your question well, about, we'll, we'll get in, we'll get into that in a second. But, but what I find interesting is, is often I think people assume that going after the arts won't later in life support them. You know, I growing up, I wanted to be an architect. I grew up in a construction family, a development family. I wanted to be an architect. And a little part of me still really wants to be an architect. I love the way light hits. I love the way that that, that eye lines work. Uh, I used to draw as a kid. I used to take chart paper and draw out all these floor plans. And it just seemed so hard and, and scary. And I went to film school instead. I went to film school. And when I left film school uh, to make, you know, I wanted to be a documentary filmmaker and an editor, uh, a little part of me was like, what is this <laughs> like? Like, is this going to serve me at any point? But when I got a job, I found that I was working in a corporate environment with only C-suite people. I was on set with people I could ask questions to. I had um, direct access to the founders of these companies. And I was just in an environment that was very different than if I had taken the corporate path. And very quickly when I started my company, I realized I could do this. I could take this art or this craft, but it, but, but the, the art or the craft gave me direct access to people where, you know, most people just didn't have those types of conversations. So I, I think this is really a, a, an interesting through line in terms of the fact that, you know, 
you didn't want to you wanted to buck the system you didn't you didn't want to go to school you didn't want to go out and get a job you you go out and spend years getting good at something that in the long run gets you a seat at the table with some of these really impressive people mm-hmm and, and what I find is those people, I mean, this was my experience and, and you know, it, it's continued even beyond just me. Those people respect what it takes to be great at a really difficult craft. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, it's like, like I look at, you know, I know people, uh, really wealthy people who, you know, they'll, like they're in, they're, they want new cabinets in their kitchen and they'll go find the best cabinet guy in the state and pay whatever he requires to come do their cabinets. They'll buy him out of all his other jobs because they respect that craft. And, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of what I had going for me is people, A, I showed up, I was a professional. I didn't like steal the silverware and they respected that this young kid was clearly worked his butt off. And you were good? I was good. I was never going to win the Van Cliburn competition, but I, at one point I had a thousand songs memorized. I don't know what the fu- the Van Cliburn. I don't know if anyone listening knows what that is. What is that? It's the it's you know the, or the the Tchaikovsky competition. There's a few competitions. Van Cliburn is held every four years. It's like the Olympics of virtuoso classical piano. Okay. And it's held in Fort Worth, Texas, incidentally. But I was never going to win that. I was never even going to get invited. But I had a thousand songs memorized, and I and, and you know I mean there's just the the fact that I could walk into a nightclub and take virtually any request without sheet music people respect that yeah yeah that like impressive and kind of badass i mean i love piano bars i love the dueling pianos and stuff and and i know that there's tricks to learning songs and memorizing songs and making your way through it but the Mm -hmm. level that it sounds like you're playing at just requires a discipline that most people marvel at but most people won't put the time into i took my son to a hockey game uh, an OHL game, and he's looking at these guys. You know, they're all 18, 19. OHL's one level down from um, mm-hmm. NHL. And they are just, they're just working so hard to impress people. And my son's like, I want to do that. And I said, great. Let's get you back into skating lessons. You didn't want to do skating lessons. Mm-hmm. Let's get you back into that. And he's like, never mind. <laughs> 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 right? Like, like we want we want to be impressive. We want to, we right. want to, be great at something we want the respect we want the status oh yeah I thought of 99 99 of being impressive is impressive to no one it's all the work that nobody sees and nobody's impressed by to to hopefully qualify you someday to do something that impresses someone and and what i've experienced with music is people write it off as like a magical power like, I'll do this, and they'll be like, oh, you've got a gift. I could never do that. And I'm like, well, I could show you how I did it, and I could teach you how to do it. And it gave me five years, and about 3,000 hours a year, I could get you there. But they don't want that. I don't, I don't remember which book I read this in or, or even who, who said this, because I'm going back maybe about 15 <laughs> years in my memory here. But I recall someone coming up to um, one of these great speakers and saying, you know, I've always wanted to learn the guitar. And the speaker says, you know, I can, I can teach you the secret to learning the guitar. He takes out a piece of paper, and he writes down what to do, and he folds it up, and he says, here, read this. And all it says is practice every day. And the guy takes the piece of paper and kind of nods and walks away. And it's just like it's never going to yeah. happen. Yeah. It's never going to happen. So... Yeah, no, it's not. Anyway, and I'm, again, I'm, I, I do a lot of these, and so I kind of know where this links to the next thing, but I'm going to actually zip my trap and let you steer the conversation. But this is so fun. Well, Thank you for well, having I, me. I, I, <laughs> no, pro- no problem. <laughs> I, I want to know where the wheels come off the, band, uh, off the wagon, right? Like, oh. like if, you are good, if, you are, if you are good and if you are working and you have something that works, where, 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 do, where do things go wrong? Well, saying it works is a, is a little bit of a myopic view of, of what my life looked like at the time. My piano skills worked. They worked well enough to get me gigs and make me a forty to $60,000 a year. Um, but remember, I grew up with money. I grew up around, I, I grew up with a family that had, a, you know, a good amount of money, but I also grew up seeing what a lot of money looked like. So I didn't have that same limiting belief that a lot of people have that like money is this inaccessible thing that's only for other people. I knew people that had tons of it 
I'd seen my parents accumulate a good amount of it. And frankly, I knew that life is a whole lot better when you had more of it. And so being a broke musician my whole life, you know, it kind of started to lose its luster and particularly around 26, 27 years old. Because remember, I didn't start till I was 16, almost seven years old. And so I missed a lot of the formative years. I mean, the teachers were right. I, was, I didn't know, but I was going to end up having significant mechanical hand problems, hand and wrist problems, because I started late and I overdid it. I, I played too much. Um, so I started to develop arthritis in my right wrist by about 26, it was pretty bad by 27 years old. So I realized I can't do this forever. But, it's, but I had already kind of started to shift my attention towards starting businesses because I was sick of being poor. And frankly, I'd already been divorced once because, you know, girls like you when you're the musician at the club and, you're, and it's cool that for then. But like three years later when they're married to you, it, it, it's not that glamorous. You're, you're not around in the evening. You're, yeah. you're gone every single weekend, all that stuff. Yeah, and they know how they met you, so they assume that when you're out at a gig, you're doing more of the same, meeting the next groupie or what, like it, whatever. It, that's a whole other story. But so yeah, I just I had kind of started to to shift, and um, I, I was I was divorced. I I, I had I, I was overworked. I was playing six to nine gigs one year. I actually played four hundred gigs. <laughs> Think about that in three hundred and sixty five days. So, and that's, that's nights and weekends, you know, two gigs on Saturdays, three gigs on Sundays sometimes. And then, uh, teaching lessons too. And I'm going to school. I ended up getting into college, even though I dropped out of high school, I was able to get into college on a music scholarship. So I'm, I'm just exhausted and I'm injured by like 27 years old and I'm divorced and I'm broke. So it wasn't like all sunshine and unicorns. Um, but I guess what, I mean, so that's, that's what, how the wheels kind of came like? off. What did that feel like for you? What, like, what did that do to your identity? It actually, it actually lined up perfectly with my identity, right? I, I wasn't I was on the wrong planet to begin with. So being disenfranchised, down and out, um, but having this sort of superpower that gave me at least a lifeline, um, was right where I probably, I mean, you create your own reality, right? I ended up exactly where I probably saw myself going subconsciously, but it, you know, change happens when the pain of staying the same starts to outweigh the pain of making the change. And that, that happened when I was going through my second divorce. Your second divorce at this point. <laughs> Yes, I was four hundred and ninety-five thousand dollars in debt because yeah. I had started. Uh, you know, in two thousand six, two thousand seven, anybody with a pulse, and even some people out of pulse apparently could get a could get bank loans. They literally gave bank loans to dead people back then. If you remember, the the the, the credit thing got so out of whack. So when I was twenty six years old, I had applied to the Small Business Administration to get these bank loans to open up a couple franchise restaurants. This was my new big thing that I was going to do. Um, fast forward. Hold on. Oh, I hold think on. I was Let's 20. not fast forward at all. Let's not fast forward at all. So, so okay. you go from being a musician. Why did you think the franchise thing was the, the way to dip your toe into business? Well, that actually, that was my 11th or 12th business idea. Um, I had done, I don't remember the whole list, but I had, I had had see where I booked other, I booked gigs for other bands. I had had a party promotion business which cool story. I did host a rave once with method man from Wu Tang clan and got to hang out with him for a night. That was kind of cool. Um, I had been a loan officer for countrywide. I had tried real estate investing on credit cards. I had been in an MLM. I had, uh, taken the little bit of money that I had had set aside for college that I didn't need because I got a scholarship and I had invested it in the sandwich shop across the street. Cause some MBA kid was running it as a project and I thought it'd be fun to do it with him. Um, I mean, it was like on and on, right? This craziness. And so far, so the, it's like, I kept just upping the stakes. And so at 27, 28, but you, but, but again, I'm going to, I'm going to park here for a bit. So you up the stakes because you were win after win after win, or it was no. like, what's next? What's next? What's next? No, I had this sense that I was failing every time I failed. It was like, Oh, it's cause I was thinking too small. So I just need to go oh, bigger. That's next interesting. Time. Because and, and by because the way, in the end, I was right. You were thinking too small. 
in the end, I was right. My biggest successes, and I've had a string now of four creative successful businesses uh, off of a string of 12 previous unsuccessful businesses. I started getting successful when I started actually playing big and I've gotten more successful every time I've played bigger. Okay, we're, we're gonna get back to that in a second. Okay. But looking through, looking through the string of businesses that didn't go well, you know, often they say that people leave their hometown and they move off to a different country and they go somewhere else because they're searching for truth. But, but you know, you bring yourself with you. Right. Right. You know, uh, when, when, you're, when you're making mistakes, uh, Ray Dalio says another one of those. I love that line because eventually you realize that you are the common denominator with most of the yep. mistakes that are going on. So as, as you continue to ratch up from failure after failure after failure after failure, was there a moment where you're like, shit, man, I keep doing this or whatever that was? Yeah, there was. But unfortunately, the moment came after the two franchise restaurants had failed and I was 400. Well, I say unfortunately, actually, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. One of them. Uh, it was meeting my wife and kids is the, the best thing. ever. But, uh, it, you know, when I had that moment, I was on failure number 12. I was $495,000 in debt. I was uh, about 330000 of that debt was actually to the United States Treasury because they were SBA, Small Business Administration, federally guaranteed small business loans, and when you default on those, and yet the bankers don't tell you this up front, when you default on an SBA loan, you're no longer dealing with the bank, you're dealing with the United States government who insured the loan to the bank. So effectively, it's no different than owing $330,000 in taxes. It's, I was literally dodging calls from the US Treasury. Um, and then the other 165,000 was, you know, uh, landlords for, for commercial leases and legal fees and unpaid sales and unemployment taxes to the state of Texas workforce Commission and taxing authority. So, and that's when I realized, okay, I've got to start taking a different tack here because I am just, the hole is getting deeper and deeper. But how did, like, how did you just feel so um, much like a failure? Like, like the, the thing that surprises me is you just kept trying. <laughs> it's a, uh, in some ways, life is a lot easier when you don't feel like you belong because then every mistake you make is just additional evidence that you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do because you don't fit anyway. Yes, yes, yes. So, so I've, I've realized that within myself, I have this victim mentality and I kind of self-sabotage. You know, if, 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 I, you know if, if I think that I deserve something to go wrong, I will find a pretty good way to make sure that that happens right. Right, <laughs> eventually right. that it goes wrong. Yeah. So that way I can say, see, it went wrong. You know, that this is, this is what happens. Um, that happens with my health. It happens with business. It happens with relationships. I like to be right in how much everything can makes me feel yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, exactly. So you, so you probably, if you're anything like me, you'll create these very elaborate constructs to, to validate the, your, your identity but, but to the, for me, at least to the outsider, it looked like, man, this Jeff guy, he's always building things. He's always working so hard. He's such a hustler. And I was just finding more and more elaborate ways to, to fail. So, but I could get some glory along the way each time because people were like, oh, you're so bold. You're so in, into it or innovative and you're doing this, this adventurous thing. And that's so impressive. And meanwhile, I just had a, a wake of wreckage behind me. Yeah. Um, so, but, 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 Again, what, what, the courage or the ability, or was it was it just? Because what was the alternative? What was the alternative? Get a job. I don't know. Go get it. Go get a job. Go back to that piano? was the one no? thing. I, I I say this with no melodrama whatsoever. I would have rather died. Literally, if it got to the point where it was job or death, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So you had no choice. No, no, I was, I was born with working else, not as an option. And that is the greatest gift that my creator gave me is he forced me to figure it out. And he gave me the self-awareness to know that the other would be a spiritual death shortly followed by a physical death. What does that mean? It means I lit, I just don't, I, I mean, I'm not gonna be like, I would have killed myself. I just, I would have, 
whatever, if I would have gone to a foreign country and, and sold my body as a mercenary to a warlord before I got a job in America. And why, I mean, I think most people listening would be very surprised with how firmly you're speaking about that. Because there are jobs where you could still be entrepreneurial or you could be the number two or you could, you know, bring your creative craft to it or you could fit in or any of those things. So why, why did that seem like such a non-starter for you? Because I had a deep, and this is something I've done a lot of work on, but I had a deep mistrust and empathy for my fellow human beings because they consistently caused me so much pain as a, as a child that the idea of putting my well-being or even just my energy into their well-being or my well-being into, into their hands or my industry into their well-being was, was anathema to me. It just wasn't going to happen. And, and now we can take this any, any way you want. I mean, obviously, there's a tipping point where, you know, as you said, you started to think bigger. You were able to put together one, two, three, four successes. The company that, that you're currently building right now is seeing remarkable, remarkable growth, really, really breaking through. Um, and so at a certain point, we know things turn around. At a certain point, yeah. you can't build anything alone. You have to build with people and you have to be able to trust people and you have to work with people. And on top of, of that, what you're doing right now is pours into people. It trains people. Mm -hmm. it, gives them, it gives them tips or secrets um, that they can use to then you know, control their own life. So, so whether we do the business angle, whether we do the money angle, I'm more interested in the people angle. If, if you were yeah. that mistrusting of the people that you didn't want to pour into others, what the heck changed? Yeah, no, your, your, your instincts are spot on. Obviously, I'm talking about this stuff in hindsight, as almost as if I'm talking about a different person. I am, I am so brimming with, with love and empathy now. Um, and it was really that bottoming out in 2000 and all the debt and the second divorce and, and feeling as, as far removed from the human as I thought I actually, I was right where I thought I belonged. Um, but realizing that I'm never going to find fulfillment going the way I'm going. And I, I kind of need to maybe reevaluate how I view the world. And, and as a little bit of context, so I grew up with, um, I grew up, bull I got really, really bullied as a kid, like, like bad. And that's where a lot of the enmity came from for, for other people. Um, but what I realized, I remember kind of slowly figuring it out. A lot of it was spiritual. I read a lot of C.S. Lewis. I read a lot of Chesterton, uh, and those are both Christian guys, but I also read a, like a lot of Ayn Rand, who was atheist, and I read you know, Herman Hesse from, you know, the Buddhist angle. Like I, I just, I'm a, I'm a learner. I've always been a reader. I love to learn. I, I took that, that name literally for myself. And I kind of started to find my way to love for lack of a better, a better way to say it. I found my way to love. And what I realized is people aren't mean because they're mean. People are mean because they're scared. And when you threaten their worldview or you, or you, seem to embody something that contradicts their nor the, the rules that they think they've identified about how the world is supposed to work and you present this challenge, they'll reject you. Because if they don't reject you, then it means they have to reject something about themselves that you contradict and, and they'll always choose themselves first, right? And I just kind of found my way to love by discovering that people aren't mean, they're just scared. And I later, you know, all through my 30s, I, I've done thousands of hours of therapy to sort of formalize and, and, you know, expound on these ideas and really, really create some structure to them. But at the time it was just kind of a feeling like I, I, all these people that I, that I hate, I just don't think they're that bad. I think they were just scared and, and they didn't know what to do with me. And uh, it was, it was, it was magic that once I actually considered the possibility that maybe I did belong to this race and that they were just as scared of me, or I was just as scared of them as they were of me, and then, you know, sort of metaphysically things started to work. I, I, I went online. I started doing digital marketing. I started affiliate marketing. I, I ended up paying off the $495,000 in debt in 18 months. And, and I did it through storytelling. I did it through early 
creating videos and telling telling stories of pain and lessons learned. And now people found a commonality in my hardship rather than a reason to reject me. And, uh, you know, I've just slowly brick by brick built built businesses, uh, built a life and, and built a heart for myself. And now life is wonderful. So as you know, Jeff's current venture, Entre Institute, and you know this because I've said it a whole bunch of times, but it's on track to be a nine-figure business in three years. And that is bananas. Like, I don't know if you realize, people throw around seven-figure, eight-figure, nine-figure, ten-figure business. Nine figures, that's a lot of revenue. And so at this point, I've got to think it's easy to look back at the $400,000 in debt. It's maybe not easy, but it's easier to look at the divorces to look at the challenging childhood and the feeling like he never really belonged. Like each one of those things, he can almost wear as a badge of honor today. But at this point in the conversation, what I really wanted to know, what were the real moments, the real lessons that turned Jeff into the success that he is today? It was a professional success. A lot of it was forged at the keyboard, you know? From 16 to 19 years old, I taught my something that most people consider to be unovercomable in terms of its difficulty, which is to become a world-class elite pianist. You could do some pretty cool parlor trick type of things like transpose into all these keys. And, you know, I, 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 I earned that one note at a time shedding for, you know, 3,000 hours a year for initially three years, and I kept up that pace for eight or 10 years until eventually my, my hand gave out, right? Um, so what I taught myself is I can do hard things. Give me time, give me my own faculties, and I can do hard things. Every time I conf was confronted, like when I was in all that debt, I literally remember thinking, this is nothing. You know, I was teaching myself to market on the internet, right? I'm just sitting at a keyboard. I've been doing this for years, only now it's this keyboard. I got this. Oh, and I don't have, I don't have any mentors. That's okay. When I started piano, no teacher would take me on. Like, I got this. I'll figure it out. And so uh, I believe that you could drop me off in Moscow tomorrow where I don't speak Russian and I don't know anyone. And here, I'd be doing well. And in five years, I'd be back where I am. Only I'd be doing everything in Russian. I just believe that about myself. Where does that confidence um, come from, though? A, a, a man alone is a survivor. And you know that. I read your bio. And, and so for I, me, I don't growing have that confidence, up. Though. Like, my bio comes from a place of vulnerability. So for me, I don't see the gap as, like, let me crush this. I see the, I, I, I lean into hopelessness. I, I don't look at past successes and go, I've done it once, I can do it again. And, mm. and I, I want to overcome that. I, wanna, I don't want to be that person. I want to be the person who says, I, I did that? Oh, I, can, I can do this. But instead, every challenge just feels like another, like, I, I just doubt, fear, uncertainty. And so the thought of you drop me, I mean, I've, I've built a multi-million dollar company. I've been running for 15 years. I've done, I've done some, some cool stuff. But drop me off and... Uh, in a different country, and I don't have that that Jeff Lerner confidence. I don't have that Grant Cardone confidence. I have the like, maybe I got lucky, maybe mm. maybe things aligned. I don't know if I could do it again. Like, so that's why I'm asking where that comes from because I, I want some of that. Give yeah, of yeah. That. I, I I mean, I, I was you know, the thing I can think is, and it's so funny because in hindsight you realize that everything is is so abstract and and that like the variables that form you were never of your own choosing, which means they were always happenstance and circumstantial anyways, which means technically you could choose differently at any time. But for me, you know, I, the only thing I can think is my parents were both firstborns. I was the first grandkid. So out of four grandparents, 10 or 12 aunts and uncles, uh, I was the I was the first of my generation, so I, I was born into two reasonably large families, all looking at me as the scion to say, okay, what's this kid going to do? And I think I just had a sense my whole life that I was, and you coupled that with the fact that, and so I was born with something called Wardenberg syndrome. This is a big part of my my story. Um, I didn't talk about it until I was in my thirties. I couldn't even say those two words because they 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 brought up such a 
such a feeling of brokenness and defectiveness. Um, but Wardenberg syndrome is a genetic anomaly that causes a little, like very mild craniofacial uh, disfigurement or just you kind of have a different look. And it was a lot more obvious when I was a kid. Like kids, when I was a kid, a lot of people thought that I was mentally challenged um, or, or I would get called like the Down syndrome kid and stuff. And so that was a big part of it. You couple that, I think that with being born into what felt like a, a, a pretty high set of expectations and I had two high achieving parents and it was just like, if it is to be, it's up to me. I never bought into what I still believe is, is the fallacy that, that we see really prevalent in society right now that somehow if we all band together, other people are going to save you. Mm. It's just, I've never seen it play out that way. Um, and for me, you know, everything I did well, whether it was, you know, in seventh grade, I got really into weightlifting and I got to be one of the strongest kids in the class or what I did with piano or just, I've had this experience of like, man, when you just stop waiting on other people to rescue you or even frankly help you that much and you just do it yourself, that's the core of great things happening. But it's not the totality of great things happening. And to your point, there's a point where, you do need to start to enroll other people. And I, and I developed the ability to do that in my 30s when I met my current wife. Um, I, was a, I was an affiliate marketer. I had done pretty well selling products online because online you don't really have to be that collaborative because you just put up a website and run some ads and nobody knows who you are anyways, right? But I hadn't built like a real business. But I was at an affiliate marketing conference. I met my wife. Her dad was actually the guy hosting the conference. He introduced me to her. I was one of his top affiliates. And she loved me. Broken, damaged goods and all. She loved me. She also had three kids. And she was a widow. And I, f <laughs> I always struggle to talk about this stuff. Um, I fell in love. I fell in love with her kids. I quit everything I was doing and moved across the country to live with her and become a boyfriend, but, but very quickly become a father. And her kids really, I feel like, saved me before even she did. I remember when her two-year-old, who's now my 12-year-old, who I'm taking to see Thriller tonight at the, at the theater, I remember when she, she called me dad, daddy, it was one of her first words. And I wasn't her daddy, I was her mom's boyfriend. And I remember acting like I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I swear I didn't tell her to say that. I don't know what just happened. But inside, I just, I felt something I'd never felt before. That the unconditional heal, healing love of a child. And I never wanted to not feel that again. So I realized I need to learn how to love and be loved. And I started going to therapy. And uh, I had no idea at the time that, Healing all the, the personal trauma was also going to make me into a way better business person. Because if I look at what ensued from there and my ability to create enrollment and alignment and inspire people and give people the sense that when they come work for me, they have someone that truly loves and cares about them and is, is as attached to their, even more in some ways attached to their success than my own. Um, all that I developed through therapy have translated into business. And I think that they're a huge part of why my, my current business, Entra Institute, is the fastest growing education company in the world because we're the only company that I know of, or I know we're the only company that teaches entrepreneurship and business through a framework of psych psychology, reality, love, and personal growth. And there's nothing else like that, like that in the market. And people like the way it feels and Maya Angelou taught us that people will forget what you say and they'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. And the sad thing is businesses don't lean into that as much as they should. So point in what you're doing, I mean, I, I Googled your name, right? I'm, I'm prepping, I'm prepping, you know, to speak to Jeff and right. I'm going to do research and I'm going to watch your stuff and I'm going to go backwards through your YouTube channel and through everything. And because you and I met at a conference uh, for the first time in August and it was, mm -hmm. Uh, of an experience and we had a chance yeah. to talk for five or six hours just by circumstance but in a, in, uh, in a know, hot I, in a hot church in queens new york yes exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> but but that aside you know i type in jeff learner next thing that comes up of course scam 
Yep. Right. Jeff Lerner, legit. Right. You're in an industry that is known. I'm not even gonna put this delicately. Many, it, it's easier to sell crap to people than it is to actually do the work. Right. It's easier to sell how to learn internet marketing than it is to run an ROI positive campaign. It's easier to sell how to become a de- dentist assistant than it is to actually go out there and do it and, and rock it or whatever it is. So it's always right, right. easier. The perception is it's easier to teach than it is to do. You're an industry with that that is surrounded by people who, frankly, just string things together and just sell garbage often. Mm-hmm. Not at everybody, but you're in that industry. So, so from your background, how do you deal with that continuous, constant criticism of being compared to scams or of being non-legit or, or just, I mean, that would, that would wear on me as a business person. It, it does. Um, it, it does, but, you know, I, you, I've learned there, the only way out is through and the only way through is love. And as, as cliche and quasi Gary V as that sounds, I have just, again, people aren't mean, they're just scared. Why is that person, you, claiming that I'm a scam? Well, if you look at the review, you'll find very quickly that they're saying, yeah, I went through Jeff Lerner's stuff and he's gonna overcharge you and he's gonna under deliver and he's gonna steal your babies or what, eat your enchiladas. Oh, by the way, if you want to see my number one recommended program for learning how to build a business, click here. Then you go, oh, wait, they're just, they're just poach, they're just squatting on my name. They're just trying to rank with negative attention because negative attention gets more clicks and they'll say whatever they have to say so they can sell their thing. Why would they do that? Because they don't actually have the confidence in themselves to do what I'm doing, which is be legit. They think the only chance that they have to feed their family or to overcome their own confidence gap or their own tough childhood or their own baby that they have to feed at home that they're concerned they won't be able to is to come attack me. It's all driven by fear. And, you know, you can respond to fear with fear or you can respond to fear with love. Those are really the only two responses. And I've gotten to where it's not like I'm going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste my love on them directly but I'm not gonna let them win by making me any less of a loving person. And I'm gonna go on shows like this and I'm gonna continue to do what I do and I'm gonna continue to give and get, I mean, you look at the amount of content that I've given away for free in the last three years. I've got 800, I started in September, 2018, producing educational content. It's October, 2021. I've got over 800 YouTube videos. I've got over 2,000 Facebook videos. I've got over 2,000 Instagram posts. I've got hundreds of hours of recorded trainings in my my ecosystem, Entre Institutes, a lot of which is available for little to no money. I'm just going to keep giving until their claims become so obviously laughable that I don't even have to give them a second thought. Frankly, I'm getting pretty close. I have a major book coming out next year by the same publisher that published, uh, you know, literally the same guy. I don't just mean the same company. I mean the same guy that published Grant Cardone's 10X Rule is publishing my book, Escaping the Broken System, in like seven months. I mean, I met you speaking in an event for Les Brown, one of the greatest speakers of all time. Like, I'm starting to break through to where these guys are the ones starting to look ridiculous. And the more they attack me, the more it reflects bad on them. But that's not because I fought back. That's because I just kept, I kept playing my game and I'm, and I'm winning with love and service and value. So knowing that you have, you know, what I find interesting about you is you have this creative, you know, as you've explained with piano, even if it's, even if it's this mechanical pursuit or this per- perfection and, and, but, so you have this creative side you have this business side, you're in marketing, you're, you're in education. Um, in terms of, in terms of the, the overlap of, of how all of these pieces can come together, uh, you know, often I look at what others are doing. Like I look at people with bold visions. I look at what others are doing and I go, oh, how can I come under you and support you? Because I love it. But then my own bold visions, they, they seem hollow. And I have to remind myself, no, Mark, you're attracted to other people who have a bold vision and put it out there. If you have a bold version and put it out there, people will be attracted to you. 
Mm-hmm. Have you found that to be your experience as as you've brought all of these pieces together in, in the business that you're even growing now? 100%, a, a, a thousand percent. Um, you know, I mentioned the 10X rule uh, and, and I've had Grant on my show and, and actually I'm in talks to have him back on the show. And so, you know, I'll say this and he may hear it. I don't love everything about Grant Cardone. There's th- certain things about his style and his his brashness that, that I don't like the way they feel. And I'm a feeling, I, I believe that the way you serve is by how you make people feel um, in, in many ways. But holy crap, he changed my life with, that, with the 10X concept. And what most people, 10X rule is the, I think the more, the more so, obvious- So what is it for those, for those who aren't in a business context or maybe even know who Grant Cardone is, what is the 10X rule? The 10X rule uh, is, is actually two parts. And most people only remember the first part. And the first part is basically that everything is 10 times as hard as you feel like, as you think it should be. So you need to be prepared to do 10 times as much, right? Like if, if you think it's gonna take 100 hours, budget 1,000 hours. If you think it's gonna cost $1,000, budget $10,000. Uh, if you think it's gonna burn 2,000 calories, go ahead and fuel up with 20,000 calories, right? Like that's the, that's the semantically obvious part of the 10X rule. But the part that is, is, is like next level profundity is that to solve a problem, you need to solve 10 times the problem. In other words, you need to think 10 times bigger about whatever challenge you're trying to take on. So for me, I decided in 2018 that I teach people how to do what I had done, which was, and the name of my book is Escaping the Broken System, right? So you can kind of see that narrative. I've always thought the system was broken. It's super obvious now in a post-COVID world how truly screwed up and broken our system is. And the people in charge are completely about their own self-interest. We can see it plain as day. I've just seen it longer than most because I never even tried, I never bothered trying to fit in and selling myself on the system, right? But if I wanna try to empower other people to escape the broken system, Well, what am I up against? I'm up against belief. I'm up against insecurity. I'm up against indoctrination. I'm up against addiction to comfort. I'm up against diminished attention spans. People just can't even concentrate long enough to hear what I'm talking about. Like I'm up against all these forces. So what most people do is they they lean into the features and benefits of their product, or they try to logically make a better counter argument or, you know, convince, they try to convince somebody, they try to convince their customer. I said, I need to not try to try to win the individual battle. I need to take on Goliath. I need to take on the system. In other words, I thought 10 times bigger. Nobody else that that I know of in the online information, marketing, business education, I hate the term, but guru space, they're all out there trying to guru you with their product or the course. I'm out there talking about how the educa- there's a cradle to grave, call it a conspiracy or just call it a broken paradigm that you're born into a school system that indoctrinates you into an employment system that bleeds you into a retirement system that kills you into a, into a, into an industry of medicine and ultimately death. And at no point do you actually get what you thought you, you came for, which was a really great life. Right. And that's most people's experience of the world. And the more I find that I'm willing to call that out and say, listen, there is a broken system and no half measures will get you out of it. No small incremental changes. It's not enough to, you know, take 30 minutes a day and, well, and, and, you know, start trying to, whatever or whatever like everybody thinks so small and i'm sitting here going and i'm not i'm not reckless i'm not telling people quit your job burn your boat get a divorce whatever but i'm like i'm willing to tell people how it is and say hey the reason you're not successful is because you have unhealed childhood trauma you're 40 pounds overweight so nobody trusts you because they think if you can't take care of yourself how are you supposed to take care of me you speak poorly because you lack confidence and you, you watch Netflix instead of reading. So you're like, you just don't sound articulate. You, you know, in, in other words, fixing your life is about fixing yourself. And so we're a business education company wrapped in a personal development company that's built on very bold, blunt truths that hit people hard, 
hard enough to actually knock them in sometimes it change. Sometimes we knock them and they just go away and they say, I don't like Jeff Lerner and they go read the scam article and they buy that guy's product and they get strung along for five years and don't understand why they never got any results. But the people that are drawn to me are the people that through nature or nurture are ready to hit them with a truth bomb that nobody else is willing to drop and to tackle things at a systemic level rather than a, hey, let me tell you what you want to hear and how you can fix your life with a few little tweaks because that's just not true. Now, if, if, so if, if you could go back and do anything differently, and I don't want the answer, I wouldn't do anything differently because I wouldn't be where I am today. Let's, right. let's, ignore, let's, let's get rid of that answer. What, what would you, looking back, do differently? I would have embraced my call as a, an evangelist of empowerment and human development much, much earlier. I didn't realize that through my bullying, through my genetic condition, through my body issues, my, my shame around food and, and struggles with weight and health and fitness and through bad marriages and to, you know, abusive marriages, like literally being the guy that gets abused. Like I didn't realize that all this stuff was preparing me to go out into the world uh, with enough pain that I could be credible, I could be taken seriously, and I could have a, kind of a, a, a gravitas that you have to earn. You know, I was forged by fire. And I would have realized in hindsight, I would go, oh, this is happening. This is great. But I need to not wait. Because now I have an opportunity to go out and help a whole lot of people who are going to relate to me, because, not because of the pretty stuff, but because of the ugly stuff. But I held on to it for 10 years. I could have, I, what I started doing when I was 39, I could have started doing when I was 29. If I had it to do over again, I would. I love it. Last question for you, Jeff. At the end of the day, what does it all come down to? I just don't want to, I don't want to die with regret. I, I don't know if that's the right answer. I don't know if that's the noble answer, but it's the thing that I think about at least 50 times a day. I just don't want to die as part of the timid, huddled masses that put all their faith in the external and the system or the government or, or the village or the society or the culture, or, you know, when, when we're a fundamentally a, a conflicted species where we're wired as animals to our own self-interest, we're spiritually oriented to need connection and love so badly, but most people are so clumsy at navigating that, that contradiction that they get desperate and they wait else to make it better. And that is the source to me of all regret. And I would rather be fiercely individual, take it on myself to solve the problem, whatever it is, while simultaneously, you know, attracting people and inspiring people and, and vibrating at the, the energy of connectedness by, by doing it all with great love. Mother Teresa said, not everyone can do great things, but everyone can do small things with great love. And I would rather be this, this, this stand for that way of being in this world because I, it's the only way I know as a fact I will not die with regret. And that's my biggest fear. That was an awesome conversation. And not because of me. I, I, don't, think, I don't think I'm that impressive. But is Jeff not one of the most interesting people you've ever heard from? I mean, so many lessons he dropped there. So let's get into the three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, I love this quote so much. 99% of being impressive is impressive to no one. That's so good. What do they say? I think, I think people say this, that the work that's done in the dark, the work that's completed in the dark is what's celebrated when you step into the spotlight. And I think of those things because it's super easy and it's super tempting to just jump from thing to thing, always chasing that deep desire to just, we all, we all just want to be good at something. We want to be seen and known for something, anything really, that's going to help us stand out. But the truth is, in the darkness, when no one's watching, you got to put in the time, you got to put in the focus. Then they will celebrate you when you step out into the spotlight. 
Number two, when you stop waiting for people to rescue you or even help you out. Ooh, I love that caveat. And you just get on with the process of doing it yourself. That ownership, the responsibility you take for making things happen, that's the core of making extraordinary things happen. And number three, when the doubters, when the haters, when that little voice tries to tear you down, even if that's in your own head, know this, they're just speaking from a place of fear. So you have to ask yourself, how do you want to respond? Now, if you are sick and tired of letting fear and doubt and uncertainty keep you from hitting your next level, you have got to get into action mode, AKA facing the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But I want you to remember, we, we aren't just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. How did the son of a legendary film director and friend of the man who played Obi-Wan Kenobi go from being a house painter to somehow launching a television career that took him around the world with Ewan McGregor? Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring story.